in the suburb of Melbourne, Australia, known as Frankston. During a span of weeks in the summer of 1993, two teenage girls and a young adult woman lost their lives at the hands of a violent serial killer, and another middle-aged woman was attacked, but managed to survive. Since none of the victims were linked to one another, except for their location, which was less than an hour from Melbourne, in southeastern Victoria, the crimes were not initially connected for certain, but eventually, police highly suspected they were in pursuit of a single serial killer in these cases, who was in the habit of choosing victims randomly and stabbing them to death. The community would soon find out that the killer was someone who had lived among them for a while, a 21-year-old man named Paul Charles Denyer. At six feet tall, and being overweight as well, he definitely looked like an imposing force, but it was his complete lack of emotion when arrested that revealed how devoid of humanity he really was. While some have described Denyer as resembling Canadian actor John Candy, who was famous for his role in numerous comedies such as Planes, Trails and Automobiles, The Blues Brothers, Uncle Buck and Cool Runnings, and 40 other films, the similarities stopped at the physical level. Denyer was no animal lover, nor a family man as his celebrity look-alike had been. In fact, Denyer's history involves the same telltale signs as many other serial killers, animal abuse being prominent in his childhood. As for movies, Denyer much preferred those centered around blood and gore rather than comedy, supposedly watching and re-watching many times films like The Stepfather, Halloween, and Fear. He admitted to the police that he had had the urge to kill for the better part of his adolescence, claiming since just 14 years of age, I've always wanted to kill, waiting for the right time, waiting for that silent alarm to trigger me off. This culminated seven years later. Born to British parents who had immigrated to Australia in 1965, Paul Charles Denyer arrived into this world on April 14, 1972, in Sydney. Maureen and Anthony Denyer had two older boys at the time and would have another boy and a girl after Paul. As an infant, Paul was said to have taken a fall off a bench, bumping his head. And so there was a running family joke blaming anything Paul did that was out of the ordinary on the incident. While that teasing occurred at home, in school, Denyer at first struggled to socialize with others in kindergarten, even though he seemed to adjust by the end of the year. Even so, the family's move in 1981 was not an easy adjustment for Denyer. The move had been brought about by Anthony Denyer's work. He was taking a management position at the stake place on Centre Road in South Oakley, which was on the Frankston train line. While all of the Denyer children had a hard time leaving Campbellton, Paul Denyer was said to be a completely different child at his new school, Northvale Primary. He was described as a loner, as lacking self-confidence, and as being unmotivated in his studies. His physical characteristics didn't help Denyer blend in much either. He was noticeably tall and also much heavier than other kids. His interests also put him at odds with the norm, collecting knives and homemade slingshots, as well as clubs. Using a homemade knife, Denyer slit the throats of his sister's teddy bears. As if destroying his siblings' toys were not disturbing enough, he moved on at ten to stab and slit the throat of the family's kitten with his brother's pocket knife, proceeding to hang it then from a tree in their backyard. Later on, it came about that Denyer had also treated a friend's cat in a similar manner, slaughtering it, and then he slit the throats of its kittens, multiple counts of animal cruelty. He even allegedly slaughtered and dismembered two goats in a paddock next door to his last place of employment, a marine workshop. He was fired, though, as his employer felt he didn't spend much time working and instead poured his time into a hobby of making knives at the job site. Other crimes started piling up on Denyer's record as he entered his teens, including car theft, although he was only given a warning for that. Just a couple of months later, he was charged with a false report of a fire, theft, and willful damage. He was in trouble again and again. The crimes became more specifically violent against humans, and at age 15, he was charged with assault when he coerced another boy to masturbate publicly. He even lost employment due to his treatment of people, having allegedly assaulted a woman and child with a line of shopping trolleys at Safeway supermarket. Safeway did open a different chapter in Denyer's life, though, as he met Sharon Johnson while at work there in 1992. This would have been as close to a normal relationship as he would ever have. Other jobs never gave him a chance, 
such as the time he applied to the Victorian police force. Perhaps fortunately, he was rejected, citing his being unfit physically. Unable to hold down a job only added to the signs of being a social outcast, and he continued to be obsessed with death, horror murder movies, and in general, anything macabre. During all of this, Denyer moved in with Sharon Johnson, who lived in a flat on Denanong Road in Frankston. Denyer was jobless and had a great deal of unfocused time on his hands, while Sharon was working two jobs to keep up with the bills. Not too long after Denyer moved into the flat, disturbing things started happening in the area. A burglary occurred in one flat, and all of that tenant's engagement photos and clothes had been slashed with a knife. There were also accusations of a peeping Tom by another tenant. Meanwhile, Denyer and Johnson had become friends with yet another tenant, Trisha, who had a sister named Donna. Donna didn't live on the same block, but close enough by, with her newborn baby and her fiancé, Les, who worked delivering pizzas late into the night. One evening, Donna experienced a series of unnerving prank calls and joined Les with the baby out for a while. Upon all arriving back to their home for the night after Les's work was complete, they were met with quite a horrific scene. On the wall next to their television was a message that appeared to be written in blood, Dead Dawn, and a second message that read, Donna, you're dead. Scattered along the floor across the living room and kitchen were the entrails of Donna's cats, Buffy. Blood was everywhere. Draped over the bulk of the cat's disemboweled body was a picture of a bikini-clad woman. Oddly, one of Buffy's eyes was bulging from its socket, while the other eye was missing completely. In a hauntingly similar manner to another portion of this story, Buffy's kittens were not spared. In the bathroom, the two kittens, their throats cut, were lying in the baby's bath, which was full of bloodied water. No room untouched, there was even blood everywhere in the laundry room, sprayed all up the walls and even a freshly laundered basket full of baby clothes. In another area, the baby's clothing had been slashed and destroyed as well. The flat itself had damages beyond the remains of the cat. In the kitchen, cupboard doors bore splintered holes where someone had kicked them in. The intruder had opened every drawer and clothes were ripped and strewn all throughout the bedroom. A collection of centerfold pinups that Les had kept had been slashed and stabbed with some sort of a knife. Another photo of a semi-clad model was found at the baby's crib. The words... Donna and Robin had been sprayed in white shaving foam on the dressing table mirror. Who Robin was remained a mystery. As one might imagine, Donna couldn't bring herself to stay at the flat ever again after that night in February 1993, so she opted to stay temporarily with her sister Trisha until she found another place. Paul Denyer, who knew Donna quite well through Trisha, had the gall to tell Donna that she would be safe now even going as far to say that if the police found out who was responsible, that he would make it his mission to take care of them for her. Just a few months later, a series of events unfolded that tied everything together. In June, Elizabeth Stevens, an 18-year-old student, was reported by her aunt and uncle as missing. She had been staying with them but didn't return in the evening they reported her. Unfortunately, her body was recovered in Lloyd Park, just a short drive from Frankston, on Cranbourne Road in Langwarren the next day, Saturday, June 12, 1993. Her injuries were numerous. Six deep knife wounds had penetrated her chest, four cuts ran from her breast through her abdomen, and four ran across to form a crisscross pattern of squares. Her face had suffered cuts and abrasions, and her throat had been cut. Her nose appeared to have been broken. Although her bra was found around her neck, a post-mortem exam indicated no sexual intercourse had occurred. As Elizabeth had no known involvement with anyone who would have been violent, her murder was suspected to be at random. As police went to great lengths to find the killer, they spared no resources, even going so far as to display a life-size mannequin at a roadblock near the bus stop where the teenager had last been seen, hoping that new details would be brought forward in the case and therefore new leads. Bus drivers and passengers were questioned. All of the residents in the district were as well. Even the local libraries were investigated, but no one seemed to know anything more. Then in July, on the 8th, a 41-year-old named Raza Toth, who worked as a bank clerk, was violently attacked on her way home from Seaford in the Frankston district. Her attacker claimed to have a gun and attempted to force her into the cover of the woods. Mrs. Toth fought off her attacker. 
despite him ripping hair from her head. She bit his hands and continued fighting back until he gave up and ran away, at which point she emerged with torn stockings and no pants at a roadway, where she caught the attention of a car that was approaching. She escaped with her life that night, and police assumed it was a purse snatching gone wrong. That same night, a 22-year-old woman was preparing dinner when she realized she was out of milk. She drove to the store in Seaford, but went missing during the trip. She was the mother of a newborn, Jake, who was just 12 days old, and her name was Debbie Freem. It wasn't until the 12th, four days later, that her body was found by a local farmer in Carum Downs. Debbie Freem had been stabbed a total of 24 times along her chest, neck, head and arms, and also was strangled. But, like the first victim, she had not been sexually violated. The police began to link both of these stabbings and the attack on Raza Toth, looking for just one suspect for all three of these crimes. To deal with the fear in the community, a help centre, called Operation Reassurance, was created to be a resource for women regarding how to prevent attacks and what to do if one was attacked. Even so, one more teenager would lose her life before the killer was stopped. On July 30th, Natalie Russell, who was 17 years old, was riding back to her house from John Paul College on her bike in Frankston. It was the middle of the afternoon when she disappeared. That night, her remains were found in some bushes between the peninsula and the Long Island golf clubs. Her slain body bore multiple stab wounds around her face and neck, her throat was slashed, and yet there was no proof of sexual intercourse, just as in the cases of the other two murdered women. There was something new in this case, though. A piece of evidence that would become key was left on the body. A small piece of skin, thought to be from a finger, was removed from the neck of the victim that had belonged to her killer. Also, a sighting by a reliable source, a police officer no less, had occurred that seemed to be related. At about 3 p.m., someone had seen a Toyota Corona that was memorably yellow and near the bike track. This was about the time the coroner thought the murder of Natalie Russell had taken place. The officer had written down the registration number after determining the car had no plates and so was suspect. Running the registration number gave the police a match with a report from a postal worker. The man had been sitting suspiciously in the front seat, slumping as if he didn't want to be seen, and something about it had bothered the postal worker. That wasn't much, but it also came up that this was a match to a car seen in the area where Debbie Freem's body was discovered. And that was no random circumstance. The registration indeed belonged to Paul Charles Denyer. Denyer wasn't home, though, when the police showed up at his apartment at 3.30 p.m. that day. Detective Mick Hughes and Charlie Bazina slipped a card under the door and requested contact, hoping to hear something later. Sharon Johnson was the one who called them back at 5.15 p.m., and they reassured her it was just part of the canvassing of the neighborhood, a routine inquiry. They didn't want to scare Denyer off before they could find him and quickly proceeded to put together a team. Within 10 minutes, the group, headed by Mick Hughes, Rod Wilson, and CIB detective Darren O'Loughlin, were at the scene of the flats at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road, ready to take Denyer. When they knocked, Denyer seemed rather calm and collected, and had an answer for most of the questions they asked him. Why was he driving a car with no plates? Well, he actually had a 28-day permit to do so while he made the repairs it needed before it could be registered. Why had his car been seen in the areas of each crime scene during the time frames of the murders? He claimed his car had broken down near the bike trail, which was the area where Natalie Russell had been found, and that he had been picking up Sharon near the train when his car had been spotted the other time. What didn't match up were all of the cuts and even the missing skin on his hands. He had an answer for that, too tying it back to the car repairs, and saying that he'd gotten injured while working on the fan in the car engine. Denyer denied knowing anything about the murders at all, except for what he'd learned from the news. But the detectives saw through all of the excuses and numerous coincidences. They proceeded to take him into the police station for questioning. In the interrogation room, they requested hair and blood samples for a DNA test. All throughout the night, he had maintained his innocence. But the realization of the implications of a DNA match changed the game for him. He asked how long the results would be before they returned. He wanted to know if they had a sample from the victims that purportedly had come from the killer. Out of nowhere, he suddenly and spontaneously admitted, Okay, I killed all three of them. Detective Darren O'Loughlin's interrogation was finally getting somewhere. 
It was now the early morning hours of August 1st, and Denyer began to reveal the details of his murders of Elizabeth Stevens, Debbie Freem, and Natalie Russell, as well as Rosa Toth's attack. In a detached, completely unremorseful, and almost smug manner, Denyer delivered his confession as one who was describing a job process to a group of new employees or recounting his day to an acquaintance, but certainly not like one who was describing violent acts. The sense of control he appeared to feel was something he immensely enjoyed. He was the only one who had information that they were after, and he knew it. As for Elizabeth Stevens' murder, he confirmed that it was at random. He described it as being a rainy, gloomy night, and she had gotten off the bus around 7 p.m. at the stop on Cranbourne Road in Langwarren. He was waiting around the bus stop, saw her, and decided to follow her. While it would have only been a short walk until she was back at the safety of her aunt and uncles, instead she found herself being grabbed from behind and told that she would be finished off if she screamed or tried to run. Denyer used a piece of aluminum pipe to feign having a gun held on his victim and persuaded her to go into the woods at Lloyd Park. His account included that they walked into a bit of bushland beside the main track in Lloyd Park, sat there, you know, stood in the bushes for a while, just... I can't remember, just standing there, I suppose. I held the gun to the back of her neck, walked across the track over towards the other small sand hill or something. And on the other side of that hill, she asked me if she could, you know, go to the toilet, so to speak. So I respected her privacy. So I turned around and everything while she did it and everything. When she finished, we just walked down toward where the goalposts are, and we turned right and headed toward the area where she was found. I got to that area there, and I started choking her with my hands, and she passed out after a while. You know, the oxygen got cut off to her head, and she just stopped. And then I pulled out the knife, and stabbed her many times in the throat, and she was still alive. Then she stood up, and we walked around and all that, just walking around a few steps, and then I threw her on the ground and stuck my foot over her neck to finish her off. He continued in his straightforward manner despite how gruesome the details became. The interrogation video has an account of him showing detectives just how he strangled Elizabeth, employing his thumb into her throat, and how he had stabbed her throat. He even remembered in clear detail the trauma signs Elizabeth displayed right before her death in the form of shaking. But he continued to recount all of this without any emotion. And the motive for all this violence? Denyer stated that he just wanted to kill just wanted to take a life because I felt my life had been taken many times. Immediately after her death, Denyer had then left Elizabeth Stevens' body near the drain and disposed of the knife, now in pieces and which he had made himself, along his route back home. Of course, this wasn't the only crime in which he had made use of his fake gun or homemade knives. He also confessed in detail to the July 8th incident with Mrs. Toth, having also come up from behind her after following her from the station in Seaford and having placed his hand over her mouth to ensure she didn't scream. Instead, Mrs. Toth had bit his finger through to the bone as she put up a fight that ultimately ended up with her being able to escape him. Mrs. Toth at first couldn't get the attention of any passing cars, and Denyer had initially not given up, chasing after her and grabbing her by the hair. He tried similar threats as he had used on Elizabeth. Shut up or I'll blow your goddamned head off. And Mrs. Toth supposedly nodded and started to go with him, until she tried again to escape and successfully caught the attention of another car. At this point, Denyer left to evade being caught. And what would he have done if he had been successful in getting her to go with him? I was just going to drag her into the park and kill her. That's all. That same night, he went back to the train station and got on as if nothing had happened, heading toward Frankston and departing the bus at Kananook. It was nearby this station that Debbie Freem was on her milk run, stepping out of her grey pulsar, which Denyer decided to enter via the rear door and crouch down to wait. She got in, unaware, and began to drive. It was at that time Denyer began to use his fake gun routine to gain control of the situation. I waited for her to start up the car so no one would hear her scream or anything, Denyer conveyed. And she put it into gear, and she went to do a U-turn. I startled her just as she was doing that turn and she kept going into the wall of the milk bar which caused a dent in the bonnet. I told her to, you know, shut up or I'd blow her head off and all that. He even admitted to noticing the baby car seat in the back, 
when the police asked him if anything was in the back seat, and so the knowledge that she was the mother of a small child did not even deter him. Guiding her to a remote area, Denyer continued to threaten her. I told her when we got there if she gave any signals to anyone, I'd blow her head off. I'd decorate the car with her brains. The terrified woman drove until she was told to pull over by a stand of trees. In the darkness and cover of the woods, he presented a new addition to his collection of tools, a simple cord. I popped it over her eyes real quickly, so she didn't see it, because I was going to strangle her, but I didn't want her to see the cord first. I lifted the cord up and said, Can you see this? And she just put her hand up to grab it to feel it, and when she did that, I just yanked on it real quickly around her neck. And then I was struggling with her for about five minutes. After strangling Debbie with the cord until she was all but lifeless, he proceeded to use his knife to stab her in the neck and chest. She started breathing out of her neck, just like Elizabeth Stevens, he told the detectives. I could hear bubbling noises. Just as Mrs. Toth had, Debbie fought for her life, but the isolated area gave her little chance to overcome her attacker. He was recorded as saying, Yeah, she put up quite a fight, and her white jumper was pulled off during that time as well. I just felt the same way I did when I killed Elizabeth Stevens. As the single stab to the stomach was noticeable, the police inquired about that specifically. I lifted her up top and then plowed the knife into her gut. I wanted to see how big her boobs were. He said that when he saw Debbie's bare stomach, he just lunged at it with the knife. When it was obvious Debbie was no longer alive, he disposed of her body in the trees, covering it with some branches which he said he broke off himself from the surrounding trees. Realizing that he had dropped his knife, he spent some time, perhaps five minutes, searching the area until he recovered it and took it with him. He actually used Debbie Freem's car to get back closer to home, leaving it to walk the rest of the way. Once there, he called Sharon, who was at work, and arranged a meter to pick her up at the Cannonook Railway Station, where the incident had all begun. But why had he killed Debbie Freem? Same reason why I killed Elizabeth Stevens. I just wanted to, came the chilling answer. It was not until the next morning that Denyer had seemed to think anything of the other contents of the car he had abandoned. He actually had the guts to go back to it, in order to retrieve certain items, the milk, eggs, chocolate and cigarettes, which had all been from the milk bar, and Debbie's purse. He intended to dispose of all these, dumping the milk and eggs, burning the cartons, and burying the purse in a golf course. Obviously aware that his possession of any evidence could lead to his being caught, he hid the knife parts in the flat's laundry room air vent. Yet he admitted all this freely now. This golf course would be the same one near where he killed Natalie Russell, along the bike track. This was no coincidence, though, and police were about to learn of one major difference between the previous attacks and this final one. So far, the questioning had resulted in confessions for all but one of the crimes Denyer was the main suspect for, and the process had taken a total of 12 hours. If what had been shared so far wasn't enough to convince everyone that Paul Denyer was beyond all hope of being human and needed to be locked up for life and stripped of all freedoms, then what he was about to share would certainly ensure his fate was sealed. In this chapter of Denyer's confession, he freely admits that a certain level of planning went into Natalie Russell's murder. He had a desire to abduct a young woman, and although he didn't have a specific target in mind, he did have a location, the bike track at the Flora and Fauna Reserve in nearby Langwarren. Then, under the cover of woods, just as in the other cases, he would murder the young woman. As the reserve was bordered by a wire fence, he came prepared with pliers, making a hole in three separate places through which he could drag his victim into the woods. He did this much earlier in the day and then returned to the site in the afternoon. He only had to wait about 20 minutes after he arrived at 2.30 before a young woman entered the path off the road from John Paul College. She wore a blue school uniform. Following his victim and armed with another homemade knife and leather strap, he told the investigators, I stuck about 10 yards behind her until I got to the second hole. And just when I got to that hole, I quickly walked up behind her and stuck my left hand around her mouth and held the knife to her throat. And that's where that cut happened. I cut that on my own blade. He explained his thumb with the missing skin. As Natalie struggled, he threatened her. And then she supposedly started to offer him things in exchange for her life. She said, 
You can have all my money, have sex with me and things. Just said disgusting things like that, really. He did not realize how perverse it was that he would be so disgusted by the victim he was attacking. This was the only emotion he seemed to show throughout all of the interviews, unless you count the almost sense of pride he gave off. The cut on her face happened as Denier compelled Natalie to kneel in front of him and then lie down, as he held the knife near her eye. He held her by the throat, and she struggled, and he cut her face as she managed to stand back up. She screamed. And I just said, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And if you don't shut up, I'll kill you. If you don't do this, I'll kill you. If you don't do that. Denyer described his response. And she said, what do you want from me? I said, all I want you to do is shut up. And so when she was kneeling on the ground, I put the strap around her neck to strangle her and it broke in half. And then she started violently struggling for about a minute until I pushed got her onto her back again, and pushed her head back like this and cut her throat. Denyer had no issue demonstrating the details of his actions as he spoke. I cut a small cut at first, and then she was bleeding. And then I stuck my fingers into her throat and grabbed her cords and I twisted them. When asked why he would do that, he answered, My whole fingers, like that much of my hand, was inside her throat. When asked again, he gave more details. Stop her from breathing. And then she slowly stopped. She sort of started to faint, and then she was weak. A bit weaker. I grabbed the opportunity of throwing her head back and one big large cut which sort of cut almost her whole head off. And then she slowly died. While most can imagine the job of a detective can be tough, listening to the confessions and working at scenes of a serial killer brought the detectives through such a dark side of humanity it was hard to keep composure to finish the interrogation. Yet they asked, for the sake of thoroughness, why did you kill her? Just the same reason as before. Just everything came back through my mind again. I kicked her before I left. He said the kick was to ensure she was actually dead, and yet he slashed her one more time after that. Ironically, he was almost caught then and there. As he walked back to his car with Natalie's blood still on his hands, he saw two officers examining his car because of its lack of plates and decided to leave it there and walk back to his flat, taking a different route. To conceal the evidence, he hid the knife again, but this time in the backyard. After cleaning up, he went about business as usual, picking up Sharon from work and going on to socialize with her at her mother's home in town. Adding to the list of crimes, he then tacked on a confession about his neighbor's sister, Donna, and her cats. He even admitted that he had brought one of his knives to murder Donna, but she was not home by the time he had arrived. While that may have been the start of the violence against women in the area, Denyer admitted he had stalked women for years, just waiting for the right time, waiting for that silent alarm to trigger me off, waiting for the sign. What was it about women that Denyer had such a problem with? I just hate him. I beg your pardon, said O'Loughlin. I just hate Hate him, Denyer repeated. Those particular girls? asked O'Loughlin, in reference to Denyer's victims. Or women in general? General. The exception would be Sharon, who was apparently completely clueless about her boyfriend's doings while she was busy working to support them. Sharon's not like anyone else I know. I'd never hurt her. She's a kindred spirit, Denyer said. And so Denyer was formally charged with three counts of murder and initially one count of attempted murder. The charge for the incident with Mrs. Toth was changed to abduction later on. He pled guilty to all on December 15, 1993. Standing trial before Justice Frank Vincent at the Supreme Court of Victoria, the court heard expert testimony from a clinical psychologist, Ian Joblin. While Denyer was awaiting trial in the months prior, Joblin had the opportunity to examine him. What he observed in Denyer was especially disturbing, as Denyer not only failed to show remorse, but also showed evidence of deriving great pleasure from discussing the murders. Denyer also took little responsibility for his life beyond admitting he had done these things. He blamed his parents and the way they raised him. He accused one of his older brothers of sexual abuse against him and even his lack of employment as reasons why he became a serial killer. These excuses could have been the stories of many others, all who never became serial killers, though. 
His psychological condition was beyond someone who just hadn't had great luck in life. His very nature was aggressive, cruel, and thrived on the suffering of others, the suffering he himself caused. The term sadist was used to describe Denyer. He received pleasure, and albeit temporary satisfaction, every time he committed a murder. Very quickly, though, he would lose this satisfaction, and then would set out to kill again. There was no cure for such a person or hope for them to readjust to society. With this and all of the murder evidence, along with his confession, Denyer was sentenced on December 20th of the same year the murders took place. He was given three terms of life imprisonment, plus eight years for the abduction charge, and no parole was set. Acknowledging the suffering of the community as a whole, the judge said, The fear you have caused to thousands of women in the community will be felt for a long time. For many, you are the fear that quickens their step as they walk home, or causes a parent to look anxiously at the clock when a child is late. To the dismay of many, especially the victims' families, Denyer won an appeal to the full court of the Supreme Court of Victoria. On July 29, 1994, his parole period was set at 30 years, which was still the highest set on record, besides that of Ashley Colston, who also murdered three people at age 35. Without a sentence of lifetime imprisonment, they could see a day when the Frankston serial killer would be released and just 50-some years old. Definitely still a threat to the community, considering mental health experts are unable to offer anything that could change such a person's bent towards violence and darkness.